Okay, let's start uh, until they come. Uh, last time, <clears throat> uh, I didn't have a chance to talk about sublimation, so I, I added uh, sublimation uh, to this uh, lecture. <clears throat> now, when we say sublimation, if you recall from organic chemistry and general chemistry courses, when you heat a solid, some solids uh, evaporate before they pass through the liquid phase. So that's what we call sublimation. And this technique and the apparatus was also invented by the uh, Sumerians, as you can see in the slide. Uh, the one on the left-hand side is the uh, drawing of the uh, Sumerian uh, sublimation apparatus on a small clay tablet. The one on the right-hand side uh, was uh, developed by the Arabs around 1300 AD. And, but both work the same way. But of course, in organic chemistry, we usually do not heat the organic compound directly. Uh, do you remember the technique that they use in organic chemistry to uh, sublime some sensitive organic compounds which are sensitive to uh, heat? What do they do? Peki, can, can you suggest any, any technique to prevent uh, the decomposition of the organic compounds at high temperatures? What do you usually do? No, no. After bath, oil bath. No, no, no. But you, you, the sublimation temperature is fixed. Yeah. Let's say that sublimation temperature is 125 degrees centigrade. Water weight cannot even reach up to uh, 100 degrees in Ankara, right? It's about 90, 96, 97 degrees. Um, we're talking about sublimation, right? Yes, yes, sublimation. And then uh, freeze drying is used. Freeze drying is to remove the uh, solvent. You see, when you drink freeze dried coffee, it means that they brew the coffee with water to sell it in small uh, bottles. They freeze them and then they evaporate, the water evaporates, what you are left is the powder of coffee, okay? So freeze rising is something else. Another technique? I vacuum. Vacuum, yes, yes, you, you do it under vacuum. So when you do under vacuum, uh, you can uh, reduce the, uh, the temperature of boiling and sublimation as well, okay? But of course, Sumerians, they, they, they just use directly and for, Maybe 99% of the time, you don't need vacuum, but for organic chemists, it is usually essential uh, to, to, to, to carry out vacuum. Okay, so they purified the uh, compounds by uh, using uh, sublimation apparatus. Of course, they probably did not have to uh, design a new one, as we have seen in the previous slide, they may, we are definitely sure that they may also use the distillation apparatus because it's the same thing. Either you put a solution in the bottom of the uh, distillation apparatus or you, you just put the solid and heat it up and, and then it sublimes. Probably they, they used, their, then of course the, uh, the, the vapors uh, rose to the top and then when they hit it, the, if you recall the um, uh, Sumerian uh, distillation apparatus, th there are two pots, two sucks. Can you show on pictures? In the, it's in the pre previous slide, I can draw it on the board. If you recall, Sumerian apparatus was something like this, but it had two, it had something around the, uh, the, the pot. And then they put a uh, cover so that the uh, vapors would condense over here and then drop to the bottom. What about the uh, apparatus? The, the sublimation, you can use this. When you heat it up, the solid, it evaporates. You have the crystals here, okay? Pure compound. Same apparatus, you can do it, right? The idea is to heat and cool. If you heat a solution, a liquid, you obtain the uh, liquid here, pure liquid. This is distillation apparatus. But if you heat the solid, you can easily 
uh, obtain the uh, uh, pure crystals at the top. This is the, the, the, the uh, uh, part which, which, which is cool because it's air cooled. Okay? Is it clear now? Okay. So sublimation is a simple uh, uh, procedure. You just heat it up, but you cannot sublime all compounds. Some compounds can be sublimed, some cannot. Do you remember from the uh, general chemistry courses, they used to have an experiment about sublimation. Do you remember which compound we sublimed in, in, in, in the general chemistry lab? Hmm? Naphthalene. Naphthalene, yes. Naphthalene can be uh, purified by sublimation. Do you remember the phase diagrams from general chemistry? Okay, so if you go uh, back to your general chemistry books, you can see where you have to heat to, to, to, to, to sublime. Some compounds you can, you can uh, uh, sublime very easily, but some you cannot. Can you say a simple compound that you cannot sublime? Very simple compound, you always, you have, they use sugar. Huh? sugar or salt, salt also, right? So if you mix salt and naphthalene, if you recall from the general chemistry, if you heat it up, salt stays in the bottom of the container and then uh, naphthalene evaporates and sublimes. So you can separate the two solids by sublimation, okay? Another one is ammonium chloride, usually in general chemistry, uh, Laboratories, they use naphthalene or so. Do, do, do you remember uh, ammonium chloride? There is a special name in Turkish for ammonium chloride in the public. The public, of course, never uses the, uh, uh, the, the name of the compound as, as, as we do. They don't say sodium chloride, they say just salt, right? How about uh, ammonium chloride? Hmm? Ammonium chloride? Nishadr, have you heard the word Nishadr? No? no? Oh, how many of you heard about Nishadr? Okay, maybe 50 50. Huh? Just the name of the Just the name, but you don't know what, what it's called, what it's used for. Yeah, this is the only name for Nishadr or, or ammonium chloride. In, in, in, in industry, they use it uh, for various purposes, but in the public, if you ask your grandmother, they'll tell you about it, okay? All right, so uh, ammonium chloride or naphthalene, you can sublime. Hold on, man. So uh, we do not want to suspect that uh, they use sublimation uh, by looking at the apparatus or, or, or uh, saying that maybe they have done, but there are some words in the, liter in the written uh, documents which we understand that they knew the procedure. For instance, when you look at the, uh, the clay tablet, we see that they use uh, the word suhe for zinc metal, and then they use QHE for, uh, for the uh, uh, zinc oxide, which sublimed. So in the other one, uh, is, is what they have is IMKAL. It is uh, the uh, KURUM or IS. That is the, the black powder that you observe in, in ovens, etc. So they realize that when you uh, heat KURUM or IS, you obtain a white product, which is ammonium chloride. So they mention both, so we know that maybe they accidentally discovered that uh, <coughs> Kurum uh, contains some ammonium chloride. <coughs> so otherwise they wouldn't use these two words. Now, we come to the point that after we uh, forget about sublimation, for many years, many centuries, we don't see any document or any apparatus, nothing about chemical experiments or chemistry. It, it, somehow, after Sumerians or Babylonians, 
it was totally uh, forgotten and uh, we don't have any documents say, showing that uh, the, the public used uh, chemical experiments. And uh, these procedures somehow uh, were forgotten. Now, even much later than Sumerians, around, let's say, 300 BC, 300 BC Aristotle, Socrates, and, and Plato, they were the top, supposedly top, uh, philosophers or scientists in the world, but none of them carried out any single experiment. They were just philosophers. And Aristotle used to say that you don't have to do any experiment or try to test anything just by philosophical discussions or you but by yourself just thinking for a long time, you can find a solution for every problem in the world. So you can understand everything in the world just by thinking if you are smart enough. But of course, that was the most stupid uh, declaration that Aristotle made, because without experiment, you cannot do anything in chemistry, in physics, in science. But of course, they, he was probably genius. I mean, I, ne I never say that he was stupid. He was really genius. Three of them, they were all geniuses. But uh, they were against experiments because they believed in themselves. Uh, and they thought that if they can find an answer for something, everybody believed that it was true. So they said, well, whatever I say or whatever, uh, we come out with it after a discussion with another philosopher, that's the truth in the universe. Well, so that went on for many years. So Aristotle influenced the entire world, almost the entire, almost for 2000 years. People didn't do any experiments, no chemistry, no physics, no experiments because all the questions that you had in your mind, Aristotle already answered, but some of them were nonsense, but that's what he did. For instance, uh, he said that uh, Earth is the center of the universe, and there are some crystal spheres around the uh, Earth. and it is the center of universe, and there are some crystal spheres. Did you ever hear this theory before? Is it the seven layers? Yeah, yeah, seven layers, yeah. Do you know where it actually comes from? For centuries, people believed in that because Aristotle said so, but he was not the inventor of this idea. There were other, huh? Heaven or hell? Well, he heaven or hell, yeah. yes, maybe. Huh? Yeah. No, no, no. It was much longer, so much. Telephone, Kapati Mahadarsans. Whatsapp'larda hiç iyi olmamak gerekiyor ya. Devamlı iş, işleri güçleri yok insanların ya. Kusura bakmayın gençler siz de öylesiniz ama. Okay. Any, any, any civilization who may have Babylonians. So they suggested that. Uh, why, did, why did they say that? What was in the first crystal sphere in second, third, fourth, fifth, second, seventh? They were good astronomers, so that's how they find the sol they found a solution like this. Just think about astronomy: the stars, moon, sun, the planets. You never heard anything about that. Now they said that. The sun is number one. You see, this is Earth. 
it is sun. Do you remember now anything? The first layer is sun. So it's attached to the crystal layer and crystal layer rotates around the earth. Around, earth is fixed, doesn't move at all because it is the center of universe, so it doesn't move at all. So the crystal so, uh, uh, sphere turns, so the, we see that sun comes in the morning and then disappears in the, at night, in the afternoon. Another one, moon was in the second layer. Okay? And then the planets, and then the stars, star is the seventh, so God stays there. God stays there and watches the universe, which is actually Earth and the planets and moon and sun. That was the idea of Babylonians. So Aristotle used that idea because Aristotle actually uh, uh, stole some of the ideas of Sumerians and Babylonians because when Alexander the Great conquered almost most of the civilized worlds, starting from Greece to Anatolia, Jordan, Syria, Egypt, even he attempted to go to, to India. So he learned in, in, in Mesopotamia and, and in, in Egypt that they discovered lots of things that the Greeks didn't know. So that's, that's why he admired the civil, former civilization, especially Persia. Because the Greeks always said that Persians are barbarians. They are stupid people. They, are, they, they, they have no brain. They are like animals. But when he came to, to Persia, he saw the civilization, fantastic civilization, philosophers, scientists. And he was shocked. And of course, all the people with him, the army, the philosophers, whoever traveled with him, they learned lots of uh, information. They, they, they had many information from the former civilization. So during their trip, they, they heard from the people and most of them they accepted. So some of the uh, ideas of Sumerians and philosophers were transferred to the philosophers of Greece after the, uh, uh, uh, or during the time of uh, Alexander the Great. As you know, Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. So, so many geometry or some physic, physics rules, they were adopted actually from Babylonians, but the Greek philosophers said that this is my idea, this is my invention. So many of them actually is not true. They, they accepted their rule. Look at Aristotle. He stole the idea from Babylonians. That was, a, that was something that he created because we have evidence that Babylonians wrote it down. Okay, so let's not gossip about the philosophers anymore. Okay. Now, the elements that is, when you look at the uh, Earth or the planets, whatever, you think about their origin and you wonder what they are composed of. So another ridiculous idea from the philosopher was that they, they insisted that everything in the universe is composed of four elements, water, earth, air, and fire. And for almost 2,000 years, this was the idea of, of, of uh, Aristotle, all the people in the world accepted that until modern chemistry appeared. Now, his suggestions, especially Aristotle's, and the, uh, the head of Christian religion, Pope, and of course some of the kings, uh, they believe in these uh, nonsense uh, proposals that prevented normal, ordinary people to carry out chemistry. So anybody in, in Europe, in Middle Ages, anybody worked with chemistry, they were called uh, uh, devil or jadu. They were burned alive. Jadu awa. That's what it means, jadu awa. Anybody who worked with chemistry because they created something that they never saw, 
And they said uh, they, are, they are not uh, normal people. They are the enemy of humanity. So they burned them, the kings and the, the head of Christian uh, religion. They burned them. They killed them. So because of the Aristotle's ideas, you didn't have to do any experiment. If you did, you are devil. Therefore, the smartest people in the world were afraid to carry out any, any, any chemistry experiment. Now you can see the crystal spheres, as I have drawn there, and the elements, air, air, just the opposite is earth, uh, solid, fire, opposite of fire is water, that's just the opposite, and then they had the uh, things in between, wet or something. So. Everybody in, in the world for about 2,000 years accepted these two ridiculous ideas. Therefore, there was no chemistry. To just think about Sumerians and then 2,000 years uh, during the time of Aristotle and, and afterwards. But before, we don't know what happened before Aristotle, but somehow uh, you're in dark ages. Now, we come to a point in history that we see new civilizations, Abbasids and, and Umayyad. Abbasi ve Emeviler. Anybody remembers who were the Abbasids, Abbasiler, who were the Umayyads or, or uh, Emeviler? Anybody remembers them? Emeviler, Abbasiler, kimdi? <coughs> Oh, yeah. <coughs> okay, okay. Let's see what uh, I, I didn't understand what you mean. Yeah, okay, so. Uh, they were uh, Arabic people, so if I don't remember. Sorry? They uh, were Arabic people, so okay. if I don't remember. Okay. And they conquered the Spain and they started. Oh, that, during Muslim times. Okay, okay. After, after Muhammad. Mm -hmm. There are two caliphs, Halifa, four Halifa, Devri. Do you remember the names of those four? Yes, called caliphs. Name of four caliphs? Yes. Which was the first one? Yes. I don't know the exact order, but. Osman. Osman, Omar, and Ali. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, but especially during the time of uh, Omar, they, they, they conquered various places. Soon after uh, Muhammad, I mean, during the time of there were some, you know, places conquered. But as you said, they moved all the way from Saudi Arabia to, to North Africa, all the way to Spain. In fact, they conquered the south of Spain. What was it called? South of Spain. Neydi? İspanya'nın güney tamamen Müslüman bir ülkeydi. Endülüs. Endülüs. Ne diyoruz? Endülüs neleri? Emevileri. Habat. Telefonu kapattık ya biz diye bakıyoruz. Allah Allah. Affedersiniz. Sorry. So those who moved the Arabs, Muslim Arabs, those who moved to south of Spain, they were called Emevi, Endülüs Emevi. And those who stayed in Iraq, they were called Abbasids. Why they were called Emevi and Abbasids? Abbasi is, I understand that the name of somebody, but how about Emevi? Okay. Well, anyway, so what happened in, in south of Spain? By the way, the reason uh, the, the, the, the caliphs were successful to capture south of Spain was because everybody thinks that, uh, it's, which is normal. When we say Turkey, Turkey was always here, named Turkey. When we say Germany, Germany was always there as Germany. France was there, Italy was there. Spain. No, there were small city kingdoms. Nobody said, I am German. So when, when you were an emperor, when you conquered, they didn't care about uh, nationality. They just said, we are part of such and such empire, like Ottoman Empire or, or Roman Empire. 
they didn't say, for instance, the people who lived in Anatolia, they were under control of Roman Empire. They never said, uh, we are to Turkish, we are, we are I mean, we didn't talk about Turkish name in those days, but they said, they never said we are Anatolians. They didn't care about it. They said we are member of Roman Empire. So nationality was not uh, popular in those days. So whenever somebody conquered the place, they had to obey the, uh, the conqueror, the emperor or the king. So the idea of nationality came much later. Okay, so in Spain, there were small city kingdoms and there was a problem between two small kingdoms in south of uh, uh, Spain and north of Spain. I think uh, one, of, one, of the small, one of the kings in, in south of Spain uh, eloped with the daughter of a king in the north. So the king in the north became enemy of the king in the south. So when Arabs conquered, normally, the other kingdom, king, kingdoms normally uh, protect each other because they know that if you don't help him, when somebody conquers your city or your kingdom, nobody will help you. So the king said, no, we are not going to help them. Let them go to hell. Let them be the prisons of, of Muslims. So that's how Muslims easily conquered south of Spain and they had uh, their kingdom for many, many years. Just because two kings uh, were, were not uh, going along with each other. Okay, so then what happened? Why we always talk about Abbasids and Umayyads when we talk about science or chemistry? Because, can you suggest something? What, what do you think may have happened? Why we talk about chemistry, physics, medicine, yes. Doesn't matter if you say wrong, we, we, we can discuss. We are just trying to re remember your old uh, information, knowledge, yeah. Well, what I can recall is that uh, a lot of those times, those countries were kind of like too busy with uh, religious stuff. Yeah. Like burning witches, but just yeah. Development of science, science, yes. But uh, on the other hand, the Muslim uh, people were uh, interested in science more than the other. Mm -hmm. Because they had the documents, the books of Al-Jabir, books of other uh, scientists, Harazmi, whatever, Ibn Sina, uh, uh, etc. Somehow, even if the uh, chemistry... Allah Allah, ben telefonu kapatamıyorum galiba ya, affedersiniz. Kapat diyorum. Kap kapandıktan sonra hay Allah ya. Şifreye girmiyormuş kapatırken. Yaşlan yaşlandık onda. Okay. Uh, it was forgotten for, but I think and many scientists I am sure that think that somehow uh, the scientific knowledge did not get lost totally in in in Mesopotamia. Perhaps some people carried out some experiments just personally, but they never wrote a book because we don't, we don't see any book written about chemistry or science or medicine after uh, Babylonians and Sumerians. But the knowledge did not totally disappear, probably. When the Arabs conquered and then they, they conquered many other uh, states around Saudi Arabia, those people probably got together and then they started to write something, whatever, Somehow, the science flourished during the time of Umayyads and Abbasids in, in, in, in, in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, especially in Iraq, and also in, in south of Spain. Because when they got together, when they speak to each other, when they spoke to each other, they decided to carry out some experiments and then they started to write books. But the caliphs, Umayyad caliphs, maybe. Khalifeleri and Abbasid caliphs, they both insisted that the people who had knowledge should write the books. So they helped them to spend their time for science, for chemistry, for medicine, and they attracted them to their palaces. Okay, so the palace of uh, Umayyads or Emevi Sarayı or Abbasid uh, palace, 
were crowded with the scientists. They gathered anybody who had knowledge. They said, okay, carry out some experiments, wrote, write some books. That's why suddenly during the time of Abbasids and Umayyads, many scientific books were written. The world famous doctors, chemists, physicists, all kinds of philosophers, scientists, all uh, flourished during the time of those caliphs, Abbasids and Umayyads, because of the caliphs uh, paying attention to science and technology. But, but the, the Europe, they were still in dark ages because of the influence of the church. If they did anything, they just burned them, you see. Anything Pope said, had to be like God's orders. Even they were against some of the kings. They even took over some of the kings out of power. Aphorosetme, you remember Aphorosetme? So when they Aphoros the king, the king could not continue as a king. He was just an ordinary people. So they were so strong because they were rich. Popes collected all the money from the people. They were selling the key to the heaven or whatever. They did everything, every illegal thing to collect money. They get rich and rich. So rich people never satisfy. Never say, that's enough. I earned enough. They never say yes. So power is the same. The popes were the, the, the, the, the power, most powerful people in, in, in Christian world. They didn't care about science at all because they did not want people uh, to be educated. They said, whatever we say is, is, is true. You, you don't have to read books. You don't have to do anything. Just see, just listen what we say. Because if they read books, if they wrote books, they would understand that the popes were cheating them or the, the leaders of religion were cheating them. They were just taking their money. Not only Pope, but of course the other religious leaders. They always grab the money from the poor people uh, saying that you will go to, if you help the, the church, you will go to heaven. Don't worry. But you give anything you have to church, you will go to heaven. So that was how they collected the money and people didn't do anything. Everybody was trying to do their best to go to heaven. But they didn't care about science. Because if, they, if they worked on science, they would be considered as devil or the, the son or the daughters of the devil. That's why we call it dark ages for, for centuries. Okay, so Abbasids and Umayyads, they helped the flourishing of the science during the Caliph times. So the, the, the best chemists in the world at those days were Al-Jabir, Al-Jabir, and uh, Ibn Sina, Avicenna, you know, Al-Harazmi, the, the, the, the, uh, the best man in the world as far as mathematics and geometry is concerned. Does anyone know anything about uh, Al-Harazmi? I'm sure that you heard about uh, uh, El Jabir ibn Hayyan, we have the statue, right? Herkes gördü mü üstü? El Jabir. Many people know about El Jabir, but how about, uh, uh, you know about Ibn Sina, because there is Ibn Sina hospital in Ankara University. How about El Harazmi, El, El Karizmi? Anybody knows anything about El Karizmi, yes? Can you Sorry? Can you What else? Sorry? Well, mathematician? He's a famous mathematician and he invented such concepts and problems and formulas. Yeah. He was the best mathematician in the world in those days. His books, uh, Europeans, uh, when, when they read his books, they, were, um, I, they, they couldn't believe that he invented lots of things. I don't have time now. I don't want to waste too much of my time about the other, other scientific developments, but his. Um, uh, I, I never forget a problem that he solved about uh, in geometry. Maybe later when I, when I have time, I can tell you the geni, geni, how genius he was to solve uh, a, a geometric mathematics in two different ways. It, it's unbelievable. Okay, well, anyway, so these people influence the entire world, not only the Muslim world, Europe everywhere. Their names are known everywhere in the world now because they influence all the science and technology in their time. 
Now, so Arabs, of course, with the probably verbal knowledge, not probably written, uh, because people couldn't read and write for centuries. The, the, the percentage of people who can read and write was always very small, maybe 1%. 2%, 10 During Ottoman Empire, only 10% of the population could read, read. probably 8% or 6% could write. Only 10%, because there were no schools in Anatolia. The schools were in Istanbul. How, how would they learn? Only perhaps the, the mayors or maybe some commanders knew how to read, but the ordinary people they had no chance because there were no schools. But just think about Sumerians. Sumerians had schools, and we did not have schools in Anatolia. But of course, uh, I should be fair that the schools who, who, who, which was invented by Sumerians were usually in the palace to, to educate the uh, khatibs or clerks or scri scribes for king. Also, in the temples, so that they could write down the laws of religion. So the schools were in temples and in the palace. Also in, in, in Christian world, the same. People learned how to read and write many centuries later in, in, in, in uh, churches and also in the, in the palace of the kings because kings had Lots of money, lots of uh, not uh, uh, coin, gold coins, silver coins, and jewelry. You had to keep the records of the treasure of the king. Also, in the temples, they had millions of uh, dollars or lira worth of uh, jewels and gold and silver. Somebody had to keep the record. That's why they had the schools. Sumerians did the same in the palace and in, in, in the temples to schools, not ordinary, public, most of the ordinary. But when you send out an administrator, of course, the administrators, Wali or other administrators, they, of course, they were educated. They went to school, but they, they, they were close to the people in the palace. Either their father or their uncle was in the palace, so they went to the school. Or religious man, you, edu you are educated in this church, you move to another city, you, you work in another church, so you know how to read and write. So it was similar in Ottoman Empire, because that was a tradition in the whole world. Ottoman Empire didn't think about perhaps to have uh, schools in every single city, in every single village, because there was no, no such fashion in the world. So everybody you know, was being uh, influenced by each other. Well, anyway, so... We can see that in those days, during Umayyads and Abbasids, uh, many books were written. So uh, the, the word uh, imbik, alimbik, comes from uh, Arabic, al, the, the, the, the, uh, imbik. And for many years, Europeans used the same, same word, alimbik, they called it alimbik. In English, they called it alimbik. Now they call it distillation apparatus. So there are many various distillation, but the basic idea is the same. You see, uh, this is an alembic from a European alchemical book. Now, now we come to the point of alchemy. Uh, the reason alchemy started uh, in, in Europe uh, after uh, Dark Ages is because uh, of the book of, of, of uh, El Jabir. El Jabir wrote books and he became world famous and people thought that El Jabir uh, discovered the secret of making gold from lead. So they were thinking that lead has a high density, close to gold. It was some kind of gold which lost its spirit. See, gold shines, but the lead doesn't shine. You can easily melt it. Gold, you have to go to high temperatures. They said, Probably in the past they were the same, but somehow some of gold lost the spirit because spirit gave brightness and shine to gold. That's why lead doesn't look like anything attractive. So if we find a way to put back the spirit into lead, it will become gold. So that was alchemy. 
idea of alchemy was to convert gold to, to sorry to convert lead to gold and how about silver do you, which element looks like silver huh? gray shiny there's one element that people knew maybe there are several other now but those elements were discovered later hmm? no, iron is not is not shiny Huh? Aluminium was discovered many, many years later, yeah. Silver? Huh? Silver. Yeah, but, yeah but, but for silver, which element looks like silver, but it's not silver. So idea, but gold was very expensive, silver was expensive. In some cases, silver has been more valuable than gold. Well, anyway, so silver and gold was always valuable. They were both very valuable. So people tried to find a way to produce gold to produce silver. So gold, they sold it. Of course, it was a stupid thing, but they said lead and silver, they are brothers. The, the, the, the lead lost its spirit, and they, they found the other element, which looks very much like uh, silver, but it's not like silver exactly. They said this is definitely silver lost its spirit. Uh, yeah, mercury. mercury, yes, mercury. Yeah, they call quicksilver because it moves, it, it's soft. So they say if you can find an ingredient, a compound or material to put back the spirit, we can convert all the mercury to, to, to silver. So that was the idea of basic, uh, basic uh, target, uh, basic idea of, of uh, alchemists to produce uh, gold and silver uh, from cheaper uh, materials, cheaper elements. That's why we call alchemy. Okay, there are, so we made a replica of the Arabic uh, uh, distillation apparatus. You can see it in our uh, museum. And this is a section of uh, alchemical lab laboratory in, in, a museum, in our museum also. As I said, uh, Al-Jabir was a very famous uh, chemist in the whole world because his books were translated to Latin and to the European languages. And uh, he was working in, in uh, the palace of Harun Rashid. Uh, he had some difficult books. Of course, when these caliphs uh, gathered together so many scientists in the palace, sometimes the, the, the caliph didn't go along with the uh, scientists. He asked something and they couldn't do it or they didn't want to do it, so they put them in jail. So when you read the, the lives of those scientists, you can see that they, they went through uh, difficulties. I mean, you, you were not always in, in good condition in the palace. Okay, so his books uh, were translated and uh, uh, like, like Kitab al-Zuhra, Book of Venus. Of course, Sumerians and Babylonians knew the planets, that, that's how they, they propose this structure because planets, every planet was in, in one of them. And the last one was the stars and the God because God lived, God lived, gods in those days, gods, many gods, they lived above the stars and watching the universe, universe in the earth. So sun, moon, uh, and the planets, and then the stars and God. So the, the book of Venus and Kitab al-Ahjar, uh, valuable, uh, the book for the uh, valuable uh, stones. Now, the books of Al-Jabir and, and uh, other uh, Arabic chemists or Muslim chemists and scientists were all transferred, as I said, to, to uh, Latin and then to European languages because in Middle Ages, uh, if you learn, read and write, they, you only learn Latin because they were using Latin in the churches. So if you, are an if you were an educated person, you should uh, read and write Latin. Uh, the German or French, or you just, it was a just spoken language. So if you, are, if you were educated, you had to read books in Latin. Most of the books were uh, written in Latin. So when they translated the book from the Muslim uh, scientists, they transferred it to Latin, but many, many years later, they were transferred to French or German or Italian languages or Spanish languages. So 
uh, we see the uh, translation of Jebri, Jebri Arabis, Gebri Arabis El Jabir. So in Latin, they just you know pronounced or, or spelled the name in a different way than we do today. So Jebri Arabis Al Kemi, Al Kemi is very similar to what we what we use today. So it was translated in uh, 1545. Uh, that was you know towards the end of uh, uh, Caliphate uh, rule rulers. So. Especially the books in, in, in wrote, written in Spain, uh, Andalus Amabileri, uh, there were some Jewish people. You know that in Spain there were many Jewish people. And they were also kicked out of Spain. Do you remember when they were kicked out? Because Jewish people were not very lucky because they were always exiled uh, from one country to the other. It was related to Turkey. When was the Jews, uh, or when were the Jews exiled from Spain? 1600. Yeah? 1600. 1600. During the time of uh, which, which, uh, during the time of which uh, Ottoman emperor and during the time of which king in Spain? Suleiman. Yeah? Suleiman? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> In history, they were uh, exiled many times. So there were many, you, you can easily find out what happened those days. Maybe you, you should learn some of the things that by yourself because I don't uh, give just history lecture. I try to give a uh, history of chemistry, but you cannot separate the two, history and chemistry. They are always uh, hand in hand. Well, anyway, uh, uh, the uh, Jewish people there in, in Spain, they could speak Latin, and they could speak Arabic. <coughs> Therefore, they were the perfect people to translate the books of Muslim scientists into Latin. They translated them all. But the kings, they, they supported that. Spanish kings supported that. So the main source of, of, of uh, Latin version of the Muslim scientists uh, came out from uh, Spain, south of Spain, Andalus and Aguilera. Some from Iraq. Of course, when we talk about the uh, Umayyads, we are not talking about Saudi Arabia. We are talking about Iraq. They were uh, stationed, especially in Iraq, the Baghdad. Baghdad, the palace in Baghdad, Harun Rashid, he lived in Baghdad palace, was the main uh, attraction center of science. So some of their books were also translated, but mostly from Spain. So, as I said before, the idea of chemistry and carrying out experiments uh, uh, in, in chemistry uh, uh, was uh, learned, all, all the Europeans were le learned uh, how to uh, carry out experiments from El Jabir's book. But of course, in the beginning, they were trying to convert lead to gold, mercury to silver. But, and of course, another one there was the, the, the spirit is called philosopher's stone. So philosopher's stone had three purposes. One to convert lead to gold, mercury to silver. And if you ate it or drink it, then you will have, you would have uh, long-lasting life, 200 years, 300 years, maybe indefinitely. So Philosopher's Stone uh, had three purposes. Long life, conversion of mercury to silver, and lead to gold. So in all cultures, we see that people, the scientists, always try to f discover Philosopher's Stone. They didn't call it Philosopher's Stone, maybe some another name. Ölümsüzlük ilacı, Lokman Ekim, according to the uh, legend, Lokman Ekim, we don't even know that there was a, a doctor named Lokman Ekim, but he was supposed to uh, discover the secret of long life or indefinite life, but somehow the wind blew his uh, writings and he forgot what he wrote down, and then we, that's why we don't have a chance to... Uh, 
read his book and, and, and make his medicine and, and uh, prolong our lives. That, of, that's, of course, a legend. Nobody knows that if there were a person named Lokman Hakim, but we all know that Lokman Hakim discovered the secret of life, indefinite life, sorry. So, uh, as I said before, all Europeans uh, went to Baghdad, but of course they had to go through Ottoman Empire and half of them were <laughs> captured or put in prison or, or killed or robbed, whatever. But those who reached there couldn't find anything because they, they were stupid enough to go to Baghdad to find the secret of making gold. And there was nothing, no such thing. I want to read this sentence, what El Jabir said. He says, without experiments and practice, you cannot be expert in science. Just the opposite of Aristotle. Without experiments and practice, you cannot be expert in science because he knew the important role of experimentation. Without uh, experiments, you cannot discover anything in, in science just by thinking. You have to, by trial and error, you have to do repeat experiments many, many times. So he discovered the, the, the Arabic type of distillation apparatus. He uh, discovered and purified citric acid, acetic acid, tartaric acid. And uh, he was the person who converted alchemical work into normal scientific chemistry. And now look what the uh, uh, science historians say about, about, about him. Uh, historian of chemistry, there's Eric Holmyard. He says, Jabir's role in chemistry is equal to that of Robert Boyle and Ant Ant Anton Lavoisier. He puts him at the same position, Lavoisier and, and, and Boyle. And Max Meyerhoff says uh, his influence, that is Al Jabir's influence, may be traced through the whole history of European chemistry. He says, if you read the history of chemistry, his influence is at every point in, uh, in the development of uh, uh, history of science in Europe, you can see the influence of El Jabir. So he was such an important person in, in, in, in, in history of chemistry. Now, let's get back to uh, Sumerians and recall the things that they discovered. Few other things now. We know that they dyed wool and cotton and linen. Linen, yeah, sheketan. Uh, they wrote down the formulas and they wrote down how they extracted the the dyes from which materials they extracted and how they uh, uh, wrote uh, how they uh, dyed them. And they had several clay tablets. We can we can uh, have the, we have the translations of those clay tablets, and. Uh, in those days, uh, wool was very important because most of the uh, uh, dresses or suits they they wore were made out of wool. Because wool, normally you think that you you wear it in, in winter, but actually it keeps you cool in, in in summertime also. So even though they were living in in in, in Iraq in, in uh, or Arabia, they they used to wear uh, in Mesopotamia they used to wear wool uh, dresses and suits. Now. We can see the word wool in many clay tablets, not only the production or dyeing, but it, it's, it, it, there is a strange clay tablet. It says, if the man violates the contract, his punishment will be to eat one mina of carded wool. Adama yuniyediriyorlar, yani ceza olarak. One mina is 60 shekel. That, that's probably about, uh, I don't know, maybe... Uh, about 120 or 130 grams of food, that's a lot. See, probably he, the man would die. And weaving was important uh, because they produced textiles. Weaving, weaving was invented by the Sumerians. And they used to spun the, uh, the uh, uh, wool and then the woman used to weave uh, at home just like your mother does, but then, then they invented the, uh, the instrument, the, the, the apparatus to, to uh, uh, weaving apparatus, which 
produced uh, textile much faster. Therefore, they commercialized their textiles. They used wool for uh, uh, caulking of uh, sheep and also making ropes. Do you know what caulking is? Caulking? Kalafatlama caulking. Yazmış mı? Yazmamış mı? Kalafatlama caulking. Kalafatlama nedir? Deniz kenarı çocuğu yok mu aramızda? Yes? Kalafatlama. Before the summer, you can see that some of the uh, small boats or yachts are taken out from the sea and then they repair it. But it's not only painting, but also caulking. If, if the uh, uh, boat is made out of wood, you need caulking. But if it is made out of fiberglass, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. But in the old days, caulking was important. Ahşaptan bir tekneyinin bakımını yapmamız lazım. Boya dışında ne yaparsınız? Ahşap tekneyi gözünüzün önüne getirin. Just think about the... Uh, no, no. Just think about wooden boats. You have to do something before you paint it. Before you polish it. Huh. Sanding? Yes. Sanding you have to do, but you have to repair it. You have to prepare it to the sea because you take it back in the winter. And then it dries on the shore. When it dries, the wood shrinks. You have to do something. You have the wood layers shrinks. You have to do something in between. Ahşapların arası açılmıyor mu? Kuruyunca, sudan çıkınca. Ne yapmak lazım? Aralara. That's called kalfatlama. Some textile and another natural material, zift. You, you never heard about this at all? You just mix the, the, the, the wool or, or cotton with the zift, and then you just uh, fill into the gap, and then let it, uh, then you polish it, and then you paint it. That's called caulking. So they used to use wool. Today we don't use wool normally. Of course, big yachts, they are fiberglass. But when you have small boats, or some yachts are made out of wood because layer by layer, you have to do it maybe once a year before you uh, use it for the next summer. Okay, so it was discovered by them. Now, they dyed uh, the textile, of course. They didn't like the, uh, because when you had wool, you had white or black or sometimes brownish, but usually white and black. So the smart Sumerian women, if they wanted to have something in gray, they, they mixed black and white, so they, they produced gray, but other colors, they had to use dyes. So they knew how to uh, dye uh, wool uh, to yellow, green, blue, red, purple. They were all uh, dyeing the, those wools, uh, but uh, when we look at the uh, written documents, uh, we see that they, they don't have a distinction between yellow and green. When they say yellow, it's actually green. When they say green, it's actually probably yellow. And red and purple and blue, again, they couldn't distinguish lilac, purple, red, blue, because uh, purple is combination of uh, red and blue anyway. So they couldn't distinguish it clearly. Or even deep yellow and red, they couldn't distinguish because clay tablets tell us or show us that uh, they use uh, the same word for the uh, two different colors. But anyway, that's not so important. The, of course, the dyed uh, textiles were expensive because the dyes were expensive. As I said before, red dye was very expensive and also the uh, purple dye was very expensive because purple dye came from the uh, snails from the sea, especially the Aegean Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and the red color came from two different sources. Uh, and uh, since the dye was expensive, colored uh, textiles were expensive. As I said before, red textiles or red suits or dresses 
were only for the uh, churches, priests, and also for the kings and king family. Purple is the same. Nobody could wear purple uh, uh, suit or dress except the king. You would be punished because you are wasting the government money. So only the king could spend that much money. Okay. Uh, they, they also used cotton, but they named it, it's funny, they call it tree wool. So the wool that grows on a plant, on a tree. Actually, it's not tree, it's wool, but they call it tree uh, wool. So there are many uh, uh, paintings uh, on, on some boxes, on some decorated walls. We can see that they used all those uh, colored material. Uh, this is a box uh, decorated uh, with, with uh, various colors. And this uh, shows the uh, movement of uh, the uh, army, Sumerian army, of course, to attack the, uh, the enemies, as you can see. If you look at the picture, at the top on the left, the, the chariots, uh, the, the soldiers are in the chariots, in the carts, with two horses. And there are also pedestrian soldiers. Uh, when they meet the enemy, they kill them all in the bottom. They are all, all the enemies are dead. Uh, they are under the, the legs of the, under the foot of the, uh, the, the uh, horses or in the, under the cart. The, so the, the, the, the, that represents the victory of a Sumerian army. It's a small box in, in, in British Museum. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, Sumerians invented weaving machine, but they also invented ARP. So we see a carving, probably a lady in, in the palace uh, playing uh, ARP. So the history of ARP goes all the way back to Sumerians. And uh, by the way, the, the history of guitar, do you remember or do you know where and when guitar was invented? Var müzikle ilgilenen aramızda müzisyen? Yapmayın ya, bu kadar ya, yok mu iş müzisyen? Peki. Can you have a suggestion? Who may have invented the guitar? Normally, 90% of the people in the world says it was invented by whom? Yeah, but uh, normal people in Europe in America, everywhere, usually say that it was invented in another European country. Which one? Huh? Spain. Spain, yeah. Everybody believed that the guitar was invented in Spain. And history books, music history books always say that uh, it's invented, but it's not true. It was invented by Hittites. I don't have the carving here. I just wanted to, uh, that there are some misunderstandings about the history of certain things like guitar. Weaving machine, many people did not think that Sumerians had invented weaving, weaving machine. And also ARP was invented by Sumerians, Babylonians, but the uh, guitar was invented by Hittites, not by, uh, not by Europeans. So there's a carving in our museum. In Science and Technology Museum, when you go to the Hittite section, you see the man playing guitar, 1300 BC. And the history of mu music, they, they were all surprised that uh, it was invented by Hittites. I wrote, a I wrote a, an article about that, and uh, I, I received a letter from Venezuela or something, uh, a, a, a history of m music. He was, the hist he was uh, lecturing history of music and writing a book. And he said he was shocked to know that he, he said, I wrote that it was from Spain, but it went to Spain much later than Hittites, because this, the picture is there, 1300 BC. There is no such thing in Spain, 1300 BC or 1100 BC, nothing. Okay, well, anyway, so the, uh, the Sumerians used indigo ferra plant uh, for, for uh, uh, the dye, indigo blue. Uh, we see that uh, around 700 BC, the Palestine, they found uh, the remains uh, of the uh, of the uh, dye and also uh, a, a carbonate, which is a basic. So they knew that to 
have a successful uh, blue dyeing, you need a basic solution. This is the uh, picture of the flower of the Indigofera tinctoria plant. And uh, can anybody tell me uh, which type of organic compounds are colored and which type of inorganic compounds are colored? Yeah, for, for, for organic, for organic, yes. And, yeah, and also double bonds, alternating, alternating double bonds. So electron can easily move. If, they, if it can easily move, it's, it's colored. How about uh, inorganic compounds? Yeah, repeat it again, because of? Because of the d orbitals. What kind of d orbital? Uh, 3d, 4d. No, but what about the number of electrons there? It's full or half full uh, uh, d orbital? It shouldn't be full. No, no. half filled. So the electrons can move up and down. Okay? So inorganic, you have to have a uh, partially filled d orbital. So electrons have ability to move to, when they receive energy or light energy. And for the conjugation, you need conjugation in organic compounds, then they are colored, okay? <clears throat> All right. Now, there is a plant, it's called Isatis tinctoria. In Turkish, it's called Çivit Otu. Does anyone know anything about the word Çivit? Çamaşırı Çivit demek, bahsetmemiştim daha önce galiba, değil mi? Bahsetmiş miydin? Çivit Okay. Dabeas, yes. So if you if if you wash your uh, sheets, white sheets, and in the old times, I don't know, maybe some ladies do it today, but they don't need because there are other compounds. But still, chivit is sold, uh, especially in villages and small towns. The women still uh, use chivit just after they wash the, uh, the the white sheets with uh, that detergent. They just add small amount of chivit uh, powder, the blue color. And then just dry it as it is, it looks much whiter than reality. So husband becomes very happy that my wife is a very clean lady. So you can you can you can find in the internet that they still sell chamashir chividi, see chamashir chividi. It is from the plant. It's just blue dye. You can use it as a blue dye, or you can use it to make white uh, textiles to look uh, brighter or whitish. So they also used various plants uh, to dye the uh, textiles, wool or cotton, yellow. And uh, it's called curcuma langa in Latin. And uh, they also had, they used the most uh, popular and most expensive still. Uh, yellow dye is saffron, and they called it harsaksar in, in, in Sumerian language. I think it's in these days it's 60,000 or 7,000 uh, lira per kilogram. We use it as condiments uh, to give uh, nice color to our rice and good taste. Uh, do you know anything about the Spanish uh, rice, paella? Türkçe'de paella diyorlar. Do you know paella, right? It's in, in original paella, not paella. It's written paella, but Spanish people never speak pronounce L, they just say Spanish or Cubans, they say paella. Uh, it is, uh, they use real uh, saffron, uh, and it gives not only the color, but taste also. So rich people still use uh, saffron uh, for rice and some other, uh, maybe chicken, uh, to have a good taste and color. Uh, it is uh, uh, a simple uh, material, obtained from a plant, from a flower, but you get only about three small parts from one single flower. That's why it's so expensive. Now look at the flower. Uh, look at the, the one, in the purple one on the top. This is one flower of saffron, and one, two, three. These are used as saffron dye. That's why it's so expensive. Just 
Just the three of them, not the whole flower. That's why it's so expensive. So one gram of saffron, when you buy it, it's about 152 of those red stigmas. That's why it's expensive. Saffron bolu, the name comes from that, saffron bolu. Var mı saffron bolu olan? Yok mu? Ziyaret eden var mı saffron bolu? Gittik mi saffron bolu? Okay. That's why it's saffron bowl, lots of saffron, full of saffron or whatever. Also turmeric, it's cheaper, yellow dye. Zerdeçal, or in Turkish we call Hint uh, Safran or Zerdeçal. Uh, that's also used, but it's cheaper. It gives a taste and it gives yellow color. Uh, also, it was used uh, by the doctors uh, as medicine. We, we can look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the photographs of the, uh, the plant. Uh, its n name in, in English is curcuma langa, and the flower and the roots. We use it as uh, we use the roots as as uh, condiment or as as dye. It, it's it's much cheaper than saffron. Now red dye. We talked about red dye last time. They had two sources of red dye. One is from uh, kermes, which is a special tree, kermes meshesi. It, it's, it's a big meshe a tree uh, in, in, in south part of southern part of Turkey or around Mediterranean. And uh, it, in, its insects live on the bark, under the bark of the, uh, the tree. And uh, we can easily uh, obtain uh, that uh, bug from the uh, tree and use it as... Uh, a red dye, and as we mentioned before, since it resembles, the red dye resembles the uh, color of blood, so in old times blood was an important